Coming up next, this week, computer hardware security flaw found in millions of routers. HDTV picks with Robert Heron. Full Rift experience specs. More RAM, more an SSD. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 316, recorded May 21st, 2015. All the routers have security flaws and lots of HDTVs. From deep inside the Hack 5 warehouse, somewhere in Northern California, and possibly an alternate location in San Leandro, I'm Patrick Norton, and this is Twits This Week in Computer Hardware, your weekly show on the Twit Network that brings you the most useful, most helpful, most informative, most delightful, and occasionally, ladies and gentlemen, the most monitor-centric hardware news on the planet. You may notice that uh, while I'm here in the Hack 5 warehouse, joining me this evening, this afternoon, it's afternoon now, we recorded 12.30 instead of 6.30, is Mr. Robert Heron of Heron Fidelity, and soon, soon, I swear it, people, AVXL, <laughs> our home theater podcast. Well, we've got like we, two, we have maybe three episodes recorded, and a website, we have the and a Patreon, Twitter it's feed. crazy. We have well, the Facebook obviously page. We should, we'll start posting stuff. The uh, yeah. What a week. I have, uh, I have been... Uh, uh, discovering the boundaries of child-related fluids and substances from inside of children you can clean out of couches, beds, and other things. Uh, so it's been an exciting week for me. Robert, uh, we should take a moment. We're going to talk a bunch about a really big, if you own a router, and you probably do if you're listening to uh, Twitch, uh, there's a very good chance that you are, uh, well, let's talk about this first, and we'll, we'll talk to Robert about TVs in a second. Um, have you heard about Net USB or the Net USB flaw? Mr. Heron. I have heard of it. I know okay. very little about it. I well, simply let's, hope let's, that I'm not totally wide open to the world. This is funny. I mean, Ars Technica kind of, actually the original security uh, researcher that found it, um, so the, the SEC Consult Vulnerability Lab, it's a security advisory that came out, uh, uh, I guess actually like February, but it's just blown up in the last month or two. Um, in part because it's now up on the CERT vulnerability notes database. Uh, I guess that's when they kind of blew it up. But essentially, there's a company called K-Codes, or a small Taiwanese company, and they wrote um, NetUSB, which is the code inside of a Linux-based router that allows the router to connect to USB drives or USB printers. Great. Everybody loves it. It is used by a staggering number of companies. Uh, D-Link... Netgear, TP-Link, uh, All Night Asante, Cisco, uh, Edimax, Encore, IOGear, Linksys. Um, My I'm router's not on, on that list. I'm happy. Well, you, did you click on the extended list? ProLink, TrendNet, Western Digital, Zizel. There's there's a ton. Not yeah, all of the routers, I, but a... No Asus router. That's what I'm rolling no with. Router. With the latest firmware. You got to patch this those is, things religiously. Yeah, well, okay. It's, it's interesting. So, so TP-Link, I think, has released a patch. And the reason you care about this is if you have an affected router, and it's a, a pretty spectacular, like millions of consumer routers is the, is the general estimate, is this is uh, a buffer overflow, which is a very, uh, uh, as Ars Technica pointed out, very 1990s kind of problem to have. Essentially means when you write code to this particular area, uh, it overflows, gives you access to the kernel you shouldn't have, and you can execute code on it. And my mental image, although I don't even know if it's possible, is that somebody's going to ping this USB port, this open port that's monitored, um, and uh, slowly over time, it's like, uh, you know, 20,005 is the port number, um, which you should try to shut down um, if there's no patch for your system, um, and, 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 and sort of execute code on your router and turn it into some sort of zombie botnet or Bitcoin uh, mining system or something ridiculous like that. That would be kind of perfect. If you can oh. on your device, um, turn off USB device sharing, uh, yeah, you know, check for a firmware upgrade. Apparently, TP-Link has been all over this and has a patch uh, ready to go for a lot of their routers. Netgear apparently cannot fix this. Um, the original uh, report, which came out uh, by Stephen uh, Vibok in the Vienna office of the SEC Consult, um, if I'm not mistaken, he has a quote. Um, Man, there's a lot of routers on this list. Goodness, goodness, goodness. Yes. Um, 
I believe, yeah, sometimes net USB can be disabled via the web interface, but at least on Netgear devices, this does not mitigate the vulnerability. Netgear told us that there is no workaround available. The TCP port can't be firewalled, nor is there a way to disable the service on their devices. Uh, so in that case, you really should consider buying a new router. Burn it. On the upside, <laughs> yeah, burn it. Burn it with fire. Um, or at least look for some of the open source options if they're available for your router. Um, you know, so we'll be, we talked about that a bunch on tech thing this week, but it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty nasty one. Look for a patch, turn off the USB sharing, uh, consider upgrading your router. If it's an older router, uh, if you run an N and it's kind of miserable in your house, buying an 802.11ac router could significantly improve your 802.11n performance because, um, the beam forming on the 802.11ac routers is so good by comparison. But yeah, this is, this is a pretty gnarly, uh, a pretty gnarly hole that is infecting a staggering number of routers. And probably at this point, the K-Code business model, um, <laughs> since they provided the firmware that has uh, a, a pretty, what should be a pretty easy error to avoid. Just want to get that out because it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of a big one. So, Robert, you uh, are all the 2015 HDTVs, or, or I guess we're calling them TVs now, are all, are all the new TVs out and, and for sale now? Surprisingly, no. There's there are quite a few still in the wings that were either announced or shown at CES back in January that have yet to materialize. Uh, the biggest name I would say for the best of their series would be Sony. Their mm -hmm. TVs are expected later this month. Um, actually, the month's almost over, so I'm hoping before the end of the month you'll see some of their premium 4K TVs uh, delivering. Effectively, the, the models from Sony that can actually do high dynamic range and mm -hmm. some of the other coolest and latest and greatest features of 4k uh have have yet to ship but they have shown them they look pretty damn finished and they should be on their way likewise with some of the the pr super premium oleds from lg they have yet to ship as well and then even with some of the models that are out currently like samsung's suhd series not all sizes are available in all uh, you know what they're, they're slowly getting those out however uh uh that seems to be the biggest limiting factor at the moment. Um, Vizio, on the other hand, they they announced their R series, the reference series, which will do high dynamic range, uh, incredible brightness. They demoed this two years ago, and they say it'll be out this year. Uh, we'll see about that. And I'm really mm -hmm. curious to see what pricing is on that. And also, even though Vizio's 2015 E series, their most affordable of their full array local dimming TVs, and their mm -hmm. new M series, which last year it was a 1080p version. This year they they stepped the M series up to 4K resolution, still with the full array local dimming. Uh, and they're keeping the P series currently. They they've done nothing to it. They haven't canceled it yet, but it's it's draining in quantity and availability. So hmm. I'm, my guess is Vizio's P series, their original 4K TV from last year, will just kind of go by the wayside. The M series will take over for that even though it has approximately half as many zones of, of local dimming control. And then the R series, when it comes out, will be the new super premium. And I'm really just looking forward to that. I, I uh, shout out to one of my friends who just got hired for doing some uh, work for the PR group that works with Vizio. Um, and, and they hired a really good person. I'm curious to get some more details about what the R series uh, it's going to have as far as capabilities. I'm really curious about its color output in particular. Are they doing anything with, say, I doubt they're going to do anything with Quantum Dot maybe, but are they going to use the enhanced phosphor, uh, the phosphor enhanced LEDs that so many other manufacturers are turning to in order to improve color output on LCDs? Historically, uh, red in particular, and also even good shades of things like uh, cyan, uh, were really hard to do on LCDs. Red and mm -hmm. red was the big one though. And by just simply taking an LED, uh, say like a blue one, and then adding green and red phosphor material to it, they're creating a much better quality of white light that can then be filtered out to the red, blue, green that makes up the picture you see. So that between that and some of the manufacturers going with quantum dot technology to improve the backlight systems on LCDs. Uh, right. Yeah, there you go. That's how color mixing works. Red, blue, and green sub pixels little little tiny windows that then can modulate uh independently to produce all the colors we see including white when you mix all three together uh, that's just a nice little graph of that um and overall though uh i am finishing up a review right now of samsung's js 9500 that's their mm -hmm. that's their flagship for 2015 
it is a pretty impressive display. And the big deal there is full array local dimming from Samsung. Uh, as in behind the screen, corner to corner, there is an array of individual LEDs shining directly at the screen, not edge lit like 99% of the other LCDs out there. Um, right. So it, it is an incredible, it can produce incredibly bright imagery and they're claiming it's already good to go for all of the features that'll be coming out later this year. In particular, uh, things like high dynamic range, but specifically support for the metadata that will be embedded in this content. Um, really? And, and the, the, the metadata ports. that hasn't been decided upon and could change at any time. That, that and <laughs> for most people and most of these 4K right. TVs, uh, they will be receiving this this HDR content over an IP connection, over over mm -hmm. the network or the internet. And it's not going to be with a plug-in device. However, uh, uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray has been finalized, and that is going to come sooner than later. And that will require, though, an upgraded HDMI port in order for it to fully support high dynamic range metadata. Uh, HDMI 2.0A and, and oh, few, great. I think few TVs are going to be able to actually do that. I'll, some people are saying that any TV that has an HDMI 2.0 port with HDCP 2.2 copy protection could mm -hmm. be software upgraded to support HDMI 2.0A. I'll, well, I'll, also, I'll wait and see on that. But it's also good because I've, I've, I've finally, you, you, we were talking about this uh, offline, uh, my struggles to finish this, this column about Dolby Atmos, which has become suddenly very, very affordable because Onkyo provided a firmware patch that adds Dolby Atmos, which is support for an additional, in this case, two channels in the more expensive receivers, four channels of audio yeah. that's queued above your head. It makes this incredible immersive uh, sound effect. I like it, you know, I'm not a big fan of 3D uh, televisions, but I'm a huge fan of what is, I, I will affectionately call a 3D audio system, um, like Atmos. And then uh, DTS X, of course, will be coming out at some point in the future. Um, I bring that up, though, because, you know, I'm now looking, you know, at buying my first new AVR in five or seven years because the old one's um, having some issues and it takes forever to sync. Uh, and and I'm looking at a sort of a 4K future proof um, AVR. And now suddenly, oh, great. I'm I'm going to be like one letter short of being able to support. Not that I'll be able to afford a television for several years that has high definition or high dynamic range, um, but the uh, you know the fact that they're already ready to tweak HDMI to a next version, I find that incredibly frustrating. Um, oh, and and if you want to look even further down the road, there needs to be a whole new update to HDMI in order to really support like 10 bit color at 60 frames per second with 444 chroma subsampling, which is a little mm -hmm. technical, but uh, like RGB output, full uncompressed color with 10-bit color or better, 12-bit maybe, and to go at 60 frames a second or better, uh, something DisplayPort can do today. Uh, however, HDMI in 2.0 lacks that bandwidth to effectively do it. So right. uh, the current solution is if you want 60 frames a second to do it with uh, basically 420, chroma subsampling where you're doing extra color compression and then it gets decompressed on the, on the, on the, on the other side on its way to the pixels. But you know, it, 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 it's early like last year. And I would say maybe even a year earlier, it was really the introduction of 4k mm -hmm. resolution. And that's, that really was a very cheap upgrade for manufacturers that, that they almost were ready to do that. Oh, we can just quadruple the number of pixels. Okay. We can do that. No problem. But it was all this back end stuff that a lot of people really didn't realize what 4K was more or ultra high definition was more than just the resolution. It's this expanded color palette. Right. Uh, ginormous compared to the current color standard used for HD video. Uh, it, it is a much bigger palette to choose from, much more saturated, rich, detailed mm -hmm. colors, deeper, darker colors. And on top of that now, the high dynamic range, uh, being able to do super bright details in a scene yet still maintain all the dark detail, uh, things like anything from a starlit sky to just scenes with an intense light source uh, and, and to still be able to maintain the rest of the image. Now, I, I, you will find, and as soon as you see this going as it should be with, with properly authored content, I think the color improvement and the high dynamic range improvement together far exceed what just simple resolution is doing. And, and it, it, it really 
uh, once you see expanded color, like what the, what you get in the commercial cinema theater today, uh, when you see that in a home environment side by side with a TV that doesn't support it, suddenly you want that TV that does support expanded color. However, it, it's all chicken and the egg at the moment. We're kind of waiting on the content, um, much like Dolby Atmos and DTSX mm -hmm. and RO3D. It's those are great, and on the back end, I want those to start being uh, supported. But we got to get it through the pipeline and actually get the content out to people so they can start enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There's a there's such a staggeringly short list of of Atmos titles right now. I, you know, there's less than twenty. Um, you know, where the Walmart's Voodoo streaming services, uh, see your services promise to integrate it. Uh, in oh, theory, cool. that might be coming out in the next week or two. Um, the uh, it's, you know, but this is this is one of the classic things like I feel comfortable. I think Atmos is going to be much more successful than, say, actual 3D movies, because at this point there are hundreds of cinematic movies or movies that have hit the cinema with Atmos soundtracks. It's much more compelling. Um you know, it's much easier, I think, because, you know, the sound mixer is creating it rather than the entire movie having to be shot that way. Um, it's pretty crazy when you start looking at the fact that, you know, like with 4K, you know, at most 4K high definition range or high dynamic range, there's, there's such a long and growing list of things um, to get the latest and greatest home theater experience. Uh, you're you're on the cutting edge if you're trying to do this today. So, it, yeah. It, for for the most for most people, it'll be another year or two before you start adopting these products, and and with good reason. I mean, none of it is really out yet uh, in in enough quantity or enough variety to make it worth it for me at least. Um, right. uh, there are some people who have to be on that cutting edge, and I fully understand that. And if you can, why not? However, uh, the nice thing I'm seeing though with at least all of the newest AVRs that support at mm -hmm. least Dolby Atmos. Is that right. they'll be firmware upgradable to support things like if they have the horsepower to do Dolby Atmos, chances are they right. can do DTSX or RO3D right. as well. And uh, that's, that's, DTX that's a good sign. So, Has DTSX even been finalized yet? It's I want to say there are titles out there, um, and it's it's all about that sound as objects. So when yeah. the person doing the authoring of the content no longer has to go, okay, I need to author this for a 5.1 speaker system or I need to author this for a 7.1 or a 9.2 or whatever, I'm authoring for these specific speaker configurations. It, if they can just do it as sound objects and then have, a, have the AVR just simply decode it for whatever hardware is connected to it, that, that, that makes better content for us and it makes a simpler yeah. process for authoring it and well, for ar it's, archiving it and yeah, preserving I mean, it the way it should be. They've, they've built it into the tools. What's interesting is essentially you still create like the first, those, there's 128 sound objects that are available in the Dolby Atmos system. The first 9.1, um, you know, are, are, or are standard, you know, one, you know, front, left, center, right, front, you know, rear surround, left, rear surround, right, height, 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 height. And then the next yeah. 118 objects are the sound objects. And it's cool when you look at it, the tools, there's like a, it, it's being integrated into the tools directly, but like the Pro Tools plugin is this crazy box you look at and you assign, you know, a sound to an object. You can physically move that object around the world. It, it, the room, it sounds amazing, whether you're using, um, you know, actual speakers in the ceiling or the Dolby Atmos enabled speakers that, that filter out a lot of the frequencies that don't particularly help with the height process. But the, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting stuff. Um, Atmos is now, you know, there's Onkyo and Pioneer have sub 1000 AVRs. Onkyo has got a, a really good $500 AVR that'll do it. Um, yeah, high dynamic range is is beyond bleeding edge. And, and it's another issue too where to author that content properly. And here's mm -hmm. one of the big challenges currently is that if you're if you're in you've got the the raw footage or whatever and you're you're editing this, you need to be able to look at it on a display that can do yeah. three, four times the brightness of most L C D panels. Um and, and in order to see it properly, in order right. to author it properly, and then you'll and then there are issues related to, well, if you author it at a certain brightness level that it won't translate or how will you translate that to displays that can't quite hit that level? And that that to me is the, kind of the unknown. And there are different curves available in terms of the, the output versus signal level that are being applied to these. And there, right. there are some standards, but those are the things still being kind of worked out, let alone getting 
the color up to speed on more TVs. There are a handful of TVs now that can really do expanded color palettes accurately. But going forward, that, that'll become cheaper in a, in a year or two. Things like quantum dot filtering and, and enhanced LEDs, those as they become more popular, that will eventually become yet another checkbox thing. Oh, does it have mm -hmm. expanded color palette and 4K and HDR? In, in a year or two, that will be a lot more common than it is today. But right. a lot of TVs that are out there that have the brightness capability, but maybe won't support the metadata or other things related to high dynamic range and the color, they will be able to at least do something like HDR light or, or mm -hmm. like, and, and that's where one of the benefits I think of how streaming services like Netflix or Amazon, when they start pushing their HDR content, uh, right. it'll be their software on the back end taking care of, oh, what device is this? How should it be set up and displayed? I think that will go a long way toward helping uh, make it easier for people to adopt it. But it'll always, for me, go back to I'm really looking forward to when the Blu-ray uh, HD um, uh, uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray finally ships. Because currently, Blu-ray is still the gold standard for video quality. 1080p yes. video at, at 40 plus megabit it, with up to almost 30 megabit of audio quality. That that is just you know in, until we all have gigabit fiber run into our homes and we can just push <laughs> stuff like crazy. That's still the gold standard for 1080p. Now yeah. with these new discs coming out with you know 100 gigs plus, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you can do with all of that and and to and, and and again that'll take another even after they're launched later this year it'll be another year or two before you really start to see stuff properly optimized for the format and really really sinking in and. Uh, making it as as good as it can be good is good yeah. it's funny it's it's I, it's funny you mentioned like that whole process of things being announced and taking a couple of years to really fill in the pipeline um alan up at pc per did a write-up on acers xb 27 or 270 or gosh is that an o or <laughs> the xb 270 hu it's an ips version of asus's rog swift um which is the first g-sync panel with an ips display um you know they've, they've got like uh four panels acer has four um uh as you know four different uh g-sync or free i guess it's three g-sync one free sync uh monitor that are in 1080p 4k 1440p uh versions 144 hertz g-sync monitors uh it's a good write-up if you've been thinking about buying one of these monitors because uh the nice thing about an ips display is things look better um you know the the uh the, the uh, off-axis viewing improvement it, when you yeah. move your head to the side the image doesn't change so drastically yeah. Every other LCD panel, I mean, if you're not seated right in the middle, even some of the very best TVs I'm looking at today, the non-IPS panels, you, you yeah. move your head one seat over and right. it becomes, uh, you have loss of color saturation, mm -hmm. loss of contrast, and artifacts start jumping out. It, it, it really, IPS opens the sweet spot. However, it doesn't offer the deep dark black that right. the other panel technologies do. So, if well, they can I mean, TN screens also, TN screens are faster, which is the primary reason so many of these, these, these G-Sync monitors were, were twisted pneumatic. Um, you know, like this is the first time IPS screens, I think have hit 144 Hertz. Um, That's cool. You know, yeah, I mean, you're looking at like a, you know, a four millisecond response time, but like the, the, it's, it's, like seven milliseconds will reach the 144 hertz refresh time. Um, you know, the, the Asus ROG Swift response time is one millisecond. It's kind of stupid fast. Um, you know, the, I, I uh, wish they would get G-Sync and FreeSync kind of, I wish that was a single chipset where you could just, it didn't matter. I wish yeah. they would just support both or there's some sort of open standard, but. Uh, Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, that apparently isn't going to happen, so. I, I am in the uh, the G Sync category just because of my preferred graphics card. Yeah. But um, still, though, I want a 144 hertz monitor, and if I can get good contrast out of an IPS display, I'll mm -hmm. take it. Uh, no problem. Yes. I, I don't think I've seen like full array local dimming on on a on a PC monitor, but that would be kind of cool if somebody could do that. But yeah, I'm not gonna hold that's my gonna be that either. No, I wouldn't hold my breath for that. Although I got to say some of the, the, well, let's not even go down the whole sort of 
monitors productivity. Uh, both Alan and Ryan up at PC Per noted that it's a it's a good looking monitor, uh, and it's a better choice if you're if you're doing gaming and productivity. This is probably going to be a much better choice um, than one of the less expensive uh, TN based monitors. Um, it's also an eight hundred dollar monitor. Uh, but hey, it is what it is. The uh, if you are kind of curious about the kind of how mobile processor design works or how the thought that goes into it, uh, what makes a mobile GPU tick? Uh, Ryan did an interview with Arms Gem Davies. This is really really cool. Um, you know, basically the architecture in a mobile GPU is vastly different from the architecture in a graphics card or the you know the architectural process that creates a, a, a desktop or laptop CPU. And that may sound really obvious, but there's a lot of really interesting distinctions. And it's one of the reasons why ARM is so far ahead of Intel in terms of these super small, low power processors. They're, you know, they, they own the market. There are millions and millions of these coming out because they are in smartphones, because they're in tablets, because they're being used in data warehouses. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, Jim Davies is the VP of Technology and Fellow at ARM, and it's a really, really interesting discussion uh, that is worth looking at. I don't want to get too deep into it uh, because Ryan will will do a vastly better job. But he wrote up uh, actually, I think just a day or two ago, uh, the got really in depth with AMD's high bandwidth uh, memory architecture plans. And if you are kind of curious about the future of memory on GPUs and why um, the the next generation uh, Radeon GPUs are going to be using HBM memory or high bandwidth memory, HBM memory, memory, HB, high bandwidth memory, you don't need to say memory twice. Um, but, you know, it's radically changed, different set of changes to the interface. Um, it should reduce power consumption in a big way. Um, you know, GDDR5 has had a pretty fantastic run. Uh, and apparently HBM, like AMD has been working on HBM for seven years, more than seven years. Uh, and they're just now getting to the point where they're ready to ship it or need it badly enough to ship it. Um, it's interesting, you know, and GDDR5 has lasted a really long time. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I don't know if you see the, the, the graph uh, there just below the top of the uh, 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 page, the article on PC per Burke, but it's uh, when you kind of look at the, uh, at the uh, <laughs> power versus performance uh, 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 kind of lines on that chart, uh, it's time, it's time to make a change. So nice. Yeah, those are a couple of good ones. If you want to get seriously detailed, those are definitely worth uh, taking a look at. Um, <laughs> this one was kind of fun. Sebastian of a PC Per wrote up, Asus is Republic of Gamers, the ROG, uh, optical gaming mouse. And like most gaming mouses, it has an unusual shape. There is lots of black. There are lots of LEDs. Um, this one's pretty hefty, uh, 6,400 DPI, um, 116 grams in the stop configuration comes with a pair of, uh, USB cables, a rubber USB cable and a one meter rubber USB cable, a two meter braided USB cable, a pouch, stickers, feet. Uh, but what's really interesting is, uh, it had the ROG mouse is allowing you to change the switches underneath a bunch of the buttons so you can swap in and out these Omron uh, D2F and D2FC switches, um, which I thought was kind of a hoot. Um, you know, throw weights is something we've seen a lot inside of, of mice, but being able to uh, socket and pull a switch in and out to swap it if you want to. Um, you know, the uh, Sebastian kind of nails it when he when he writes up in the article. Um, I never really thought about mouse button switches before, only that certain mice had a nicer feel when clicked. It makes sense, just as mechanical keyboards have distinctly different feels, not only from standard membrane keyboards, but other mechanical keyboards, that the buttons on a mouse can have the same properties. Uh, and he notes that the, the buttons, the stock buttons in the Gladius, uh, the name of this spectacular Uber mouse, uh, have a different feel. Uh, and he felt he had, quote, developed a greater sense of what I'd like in a mouse click, a opinion I hadn't even begun to formulate before using the Gladius. Um, pretty serious gaming mouse if you're looking for one. Uh, he, he seemed to like it quite a bit. And, uh, you know, good read up on PCPro.com. Are, are you currently, I mean, are you currently using a, a particularly uh, high-end gaming mouse, Mr. Heron, or are you... I, I am, but it's old. But <laughs> it actually has the braided cable. Oh, I, can't, I don't mm -hmm. know if I can pull it. I've got it all wrapped up in my system here. 
What the heck is it? It's a Logitech. It's got the weighted back end. It is blah, blah, blah. I can't even tell. Where's the flashlight? Do, 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 do. What are you? Class one laser product. Here, somebody could probably identify it if I can just, I'm about to rip my desk apart here. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I don't know why I can't pull this up. Anyway, but yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't no, bring funny. it up any higher. It is. Can I? Oh, never mind. But yeah, it's contoured. It is reliable. I love the fact that I actually did use the weighted system so that when I slide it across my mouse pad, I was looking to see if if one end of the of the mouse or the other was drifting first and I weighted it accordingly. And I used to be super competitive with first person shooter th- uh, games and titles. So it really did make a difference there. And uh, I love the way it clicks, the way it feels in my hand. It's not too small, not too big. Uh, it also has controls right on it too for adjusting things like the DPI or um, h- how sensitive it feels. Uh, but I got to say the little things too, just like having that braided cord. I find that braided cord actually slides around a lot better than any of the rubber cords I've had on previous uh, on, on previous mice. And and I've even went and invested in a roll of Teflon tape, uh, probably stuck in my desk here somewhere. I keep this handy, and anytime my mouse feet feel like they're getting a little old or they need a little refreshing, I just cut off some strips of this and reapply it. And it's like I've got brand new gliding uh, performance on my mouse. And I've got a giant, cool, thin mouse pad that I use with it. And uh, I, I am rather picky about keeping not only my mousing surface clean and gum free, uh, but also making sure the mouse actually slides around uh, easily and that, that the sensitivity is well optimized for how I like to move my hand and and for the screen size and resolution I'm using so that I'm not having to like lift the mouse up and drag it a few times to get across the screen or something like that, depending on what kind of gaming you're doing too. Uh, but yeah, I'm a little picky about mice and uh, I, I appreciate a good one. Uh, so without a doubt, that's pretty. Hey, you know what? I guess I could look up what mouse I'm still using. It's, but it is, it's nothing. <laughs> it is, it is nothing. Uh, it isn't the latest and greatest anymore, but let's just see here. Hey, man, if it works, sometimes you just I'm don't just need to fix it. Oh, it's the G5 laser mouse. So <laughs> I should have probably known that. If you have an X99 motherboard and you have a lot of money, you can, should you choose, upgrade to 128 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. Uh, Corsair's, uh, Corsair's dropped uh, a couple of kits, uh, two 128 gigabyte Dominator Platinum kicks, one kits, one kicks, kits. Kicks or shoes, kits or memory. One clock to 2400 megahertz and one at 2666 megahertz. And then uh, for the more staid consumer, a Vengeance uh, LPX kit uh, running at 2400 megahertz. Eight 16 gigabyte modules. <laughs> That's literally... Uh, we, yeah, so it's not like it's 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 you know two sixty four gigabyte modules. Um, there are let's see the according to the the write up that Jeremy did the EVGA X ninety nine classified Asrox X ninety nine Extreme four and the Asus X ninety nine EWS are amongst the few literally handful of motherboards that will support uh, this amount of memory because you need eight slots uh, to support it. eight sixteen gigabyte modules. That's I, I know people who memory. actually need all that memory too. I, I, was, I don't. I rarely exceed. I think maybe four gigs of usage in most scenarios, but unless it's something really special that's actually consuming all the memory. But I have people who do a three D modeling with like laser scanners, and mm-hmm. they're collecting bajillions of data points, and they yeah. they are often they're like i could only get 64 gigs in this motherboard before and having the ability to go to 128 was a practical benefit uh for most people it's just total overkill and it's there's just no reason but but there are cases where it is it is necessary and needed and i'm glad to actually see the product out there so that's laughing we built a uh a video editing machine for jader um uh, back at the Revision 3s, the the senior editor at Revision 3, um, and we built 64 gigabytes of RAM, and he would be so stoked about having 128 gigabytes in an editing machine, I would imagine. NVIDIA Shield and Shield Pro showed up on Amazon temporarily. <laughs> Thank you, Amazon. Um, so this is the Shield console device, um, and the NVIDIA Shield Pro 
uh, it's like the 500 gigabyte Android TV and the 16 gigabyte Android TV, um, shield controller cables. Um, you know, so we had the, the GDC announcement, uh, back in March and the, yeah, NVIDIA Tiger X1 processor, 256 core Maxwell GPU, three gigabytes of RAM, 4K Ultra HD ready with 4K playback and capture 60 frames per second, supporting VP9, H.265, and H.264, 7.1 and 5.1 surround sound, pass through over HDMI. Um, you know, That's basically this is about, yeah, this is, you know, for game stream and grid, um, you know, it's uh, uh, something a lot of people are excited about. Um, a lot of people are curious about, and the lists went up and went down, but that probably is a strong indication that the new Shield products are about to ship or that somebody was really jumping the gun at Amazon, which I doubt. <laughs> Amazon's pretty good about that stuff. That's, that's going to be I, interesting, too. Oops, I love Android TV. I, I, I like that interface on a television. It is so clean compared to what a lot of manufacturers are doing. Like Sony, all of, At least all the Sony TVs I've seen for 2015 are all running Android TV, and hmm. it just it looks nice. So if this is a product you could add to maybe your TV that lacks right. uh, either smart capabilities or you just want something with a little oomph, definitely, for, for pushing up the apparently 4K <laughs> ready resolution, uh, right. that, that's pretty sweet. I do, I do appreciate that. Granted, it seems like my entire life is trapped in Google somewhere, but, uh, well, why but I do appreciate Now that Windows Media Center only has six or seven years to go... <laughs> You can, How old you can will start I be planning. when that finally dies? I don't know. But I am. You know what? There's a lot going on in that space, too, that's really cool. That recent Kickstarter with the Silicon Dust folks where they're yeah. basically going to put the guts of the DVR in a NAS device. And then they would love more NAS manufacturers to jump on board. But that's like about time somebody had that thought because there, mm -hmm. are, there are plenty of great NAS products that have capable processors and, and they're made to store stuff. So why not put the why not put the the DVR slash channel guide and all that other good stuff built into the NAS product that you're going to probably need something like that anyway mm -hmm. uh, for other purposes for you know backup and 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 data storage, but and then to be able to link that with network related tuner products and they just finished their Kickstarter round and they pushed it past I want to say three three four hundred grand so they're going to be shipping products later this summer. Um, and I, I am really looking forward to it and I hope that becomes a nice trend because I like the concept of a network tuner, uh, where, yeah. you, you know, it's just, you put it wherever it's convenient on your home network and then, and then you can just access it that way with any device that's in your local network. And it's, yeah. it's, it's great. I, and, th and their hardware is awesome. I just, I use one of their dual tuner over the air tuners currently for my, hmm. my over the air reception. And, and I, prior to that, I was using their triple tuner for, for cable card tuning. And, and it's just, uh, I've been looking forward to this project though, with integrating the product or integrating the software into a NAS and hopefully, hopefully more NAS manufacturers, like, like the good folks over Synology. I hope they jump mm -hmm. on board because Synology already does a ton of cool stuff with their hardware, yeah. everything from security camera recording to running your own email server, which, and I guess that's mm -hmm. not so uncommon, but I want to well, see it. I want to see a Synology product though, doing my DVR as well. That would be so. pretty badass. And this is, I mean, this is, I, you know, I was, I, I, I somehow managed to completely miss this Kickstarter project. Three hundred seventy thousand raised, thirty nine hundred oh, cool. backers. So yeah, and they literally. What is that like, sound? <laughs> Do you hear that? That is the sound like a, of packaging. Oh, here okay. In the oh, it's tape guns. Okay. Yes, it is tape guns. <laughs> the glorious sound of tape guns. I, I, I work in a is. very sophisticated environment. <laughs> <laughs> At M Tig tweets, I miss HD Nation so much. Good. We'll be excited about you. EV Excel. Um, yeah. I'm looking for a quote, <laughs> future proof, unquote, 4K 55 inch TV. Is the LG 55 UC 9700 nice? I'm kind of worried about chroma. Roma. Roma. Um, probably probably you know, wants to connect a computer to it. And he's looking for something that'll support RGB input or 444 component right. input. Um, and and that's a valid concern. And I need a it, I need an easier way to test for that, uh, besides connecting it to a computer. Um, you need a you need a late model graphics card that supports HDMI right. 2.0, and then you need to run a specialized test pattern. I wish my I have a 4K signal generator, but it won't test that. Mm -hmm. It'll test 4K 60 at 420, 
but not the 444. Future proofing, though, is a whole different ball of wax. And don't don't, <laughs> don't try. Uh, yeah. Stick to your budget. Uh, th that is likely not going to be an HDR ready TV. You're just going specifically for oh, maybe it is. I, I can't tell. I can't tell what that model is. He lists a Chilean model of an LG TV and I don't can't find its equivalent for. It is curved though, isn't it? So it's probably OLED. Yeah. I don't think LG it's makes fifty five inch okay. curved. That must yeah, be an I mean, OLED because I don't think they make curved LCDs. So I'm guessing. I'm really guessing here. However, okay, no OLEDs that I'm aware of for this year will support HDR. Mm. Go figure. Uh, they, they LG did announce that they will be doing HDR something with over IP into into one specific model of right. their of their uh, announced OLED line that will be receiving a firmware update coming up. I think it's the 9600 series. Now, if, if you can't do the peak brightness of HDR, and I'm not aware of an OLED that really can. Mm -hmm. However, what OLED can do though, is that perfect black. So mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't need a thousand nits if I'm sitting in a dark room, but it is nice to have a star just peak and shoot that little beam of light out on a TV that can do that. So yeah. this, okay. So this is, this is, oh, go ahead. this is, yeah, it is a, it's a curved TV, um, you know, 4k picture, IPS 4k. Uh, it's got their smart oh, it's TV. IPS, features it's LCD then, so, yeah. Okay. I, I, um, I would just make sure it's a good value for you. And it, it, and for an IPS TV, it has to have some form of local dimming, unless you're right. going to be viewing this in a, in a brightly lit room. Most of the time, uh, then it's less of a concern. But when you start getting into darkroom viewing, that's where you want good black levels. And like we were mm -hmm. talking about earlier with IPS televisions, that's their one main weakness. You get the great viewing angles wider right. than wider than other panel technologies, LCD panel technologies. But um, it ain't no OLED as far as wide viewing and <laughs> it, and and the color saturation, too. Uh, it, it's probably a great TV. I have no doubt. I'm really liking what LG is doing this year in particular. Uh, however, it's like, uh, uh, hmm, I just keep thinking. It's like, <laughs> it, 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 if you're buying 4K right now, it's it's kind of a crapshoot to see how it'll all turn out yeah. by the end of the year in terms of. Well, I mean, let's 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 address that directly. Um, you can buy for what's available now. You yeah. can hope what you buy now is going to be compatible with decisions made later like, like we mentioned earlier like you know hdr is going to be really really cool if you want it wait you know unless you have a lot of money and can buy it you know two or four thousand television dollar television today and then another one in a year or two wait until the spec and and the content delivery gets ironed out you know 4k 60 hertz you're good to go right uh oh. if you if you want it to support hdr it's a crapshoot um you oh, know right. stop obsessing over the operating system that's built inside of your like you know okay android tv and the sony machines is pretty pretty good but th the reality is in a year you know a roku 3 or a roku 4 or the next generation apple tv or any of a number of set top boxes are probably going to kick the snot out of what was built into your tv at the factory either because you know it is starting to get long in the tooth or because they're not supporting it there's this horrible you know habit of televisions being released and getting maybe a patch maybe two patches and then they're three or four years old and you're like wow i can still play netflix oh wait i can't you know what i mean well, okay I'm, I'm exaggerating with that but it's it's frustrating you'll, you'll because, always be able to play netflix <laughs> yeah you'll, you'll always you'll always be able to play netflix um oh. but you know yeah but i mean you also may be going like bink 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 Bing, 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 when inside the How Netflix, you know, it is the experience. It, yeah. Or, you know, Amazon Fire TV, you know, play this movie or the next generation Apple is supposed to, you know, integrate Siri or the fabulous controls and the speed of the Roku three. Um, there is no future proofing. You can get as good as possible. We can tell you when it's too early to buy something, um, you know, but if you want the next generation features, you need to wait for the next generation television, you know, in terms of, you know, 4k content that's available now, um, which is not HDR and not ultra Blu-ray. This should be a fantastic television. Um, my, it's my favorite 55 inch TV, 55 mm -hmm. inch is still LG's EC 9300. They're OLED. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a curved OLED at 55 inches, but 
I have yet to see uh, that comes as close to the plasma, the best of plasma experience that I've ever had. It has that just incredible black level. I mean, a perfect black, which gives you in a dark room viewing environment. It is phenomenal in terms of it's a uh, it's viewing. And they've they've done several software updates to it to fix some little bugs here and there. Uh, and and they even added the the new WebOS 2.0. See, that's like that TV that you knew LG is going to carry that over through 2015, even though it was introduced last year. So they're actually going an extra step to make sure it stays mm -hmm. updated in, in similar spec, at least in terms of the software package as their latest and greatest. However, mm -hmm. you start looking at like a 65-inch OLED at 4K resolution. Those are about $10,000 right now. Right. You look at that TV I'm looking at right now, the 65-inch uh, Samsung 9500. That's right. that's about 5,500. The the 78 inch is about 15 grand, and the 88 inch is about 25 grand. And it's like, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you kind of draw your and and I'll be honest with you too. Uh, the software on these TVs is what generally will lag. There's a there's right. so much going on in the back end. Uh, between the standards for everything from HDMI to HDR to new operating systems and integration mm -hmm. and making it all work right and play nice. And I, I hate buying anything on the cutting edge right now as these TVs get more and more advanced. Uh, I almost long for the day of just a decent projector where it's like, right. okay, I might do 3D on it. Probably not, but still. On the other hand, it'll at least I know it's a good I know it's going to deliver a phenomenal viewing experience and I can add whatever other devices I want to it down the road. Like, right. say, I'm thinking of like Sony's new 350 uh, that just came out. That's a it, it listed for 10 grand on sale. You can get it for about eight grand. But that's a true 4K projector. Uh, you compare that to the twenty five, twenty, twenty five thousand dollar version they had last year. That shows you where that's going. And Sony makes a tremendous 1080p projector that's under two grand. So, right. and, and I've had, I found them to be terrific in terms of just color quality, calibration. Mm -hmm. You're, you're not doing yeah. HDR on those and you're not, you're not, I'll be curious to see if they even have full support for HD CP 2.2 on the 4k projectors. They must, I'm assuming they probably do on that, but careful but, what you assume about. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> But that's a that's One, a tough call. I, I, the ninety seven hundred it it looks like a good TV. I wouldn't buy right. last year's four K technology at this point, and and if what's out currently is a little expensive, um, hold off and wait wait for the prices to come down a little bit. Um, don't be in a hurry. Uh, I, it's hard to say for some folks. You know, you just you got to buy it now. But um, it's a trade off uh, between getting just good enough. Focus on what the room is. How, what is the question I always ask people is what is the room most like, or what's your viewing scenario most commonly uh, in terms of how you watch TV? Do you always have the lights on? Is it mostly during the day? Is it mostly at night? Is it some combination of the two? And, and if it's going to be daytime viewing or a bright room environments, you're just going for pure brightness. And, and if it's the opposite of that, where it's like, I'm at home at night, uh, I, I generally the lights aren't too bright. And sometimes I'll turn all the lights off. That's where you want to focus more on that dark room, black level performance where the TV doesn't have to be so bright, but you want to make sure that when you look at like the letterbox bars of a movie or, or, or just, just any time where you can perceive your eye is adjusted well for dark room viewing that you, you're getting inky dark black instead of something that's a glowing gray or, or worse, some weird color shifted nonsense. But th those are the two main points. So, uh, I love the full array local dimming, especially mm -hmm. I got to admit Vizio for their, for their value. Uh, that full array local dimming system is one of the brightest TVs I've, I've seen. Uh, it uses uh, mostly VA panel technology. So the vertically aligned, so you're going to get the, the better black level performance, but at the same point, just that full array local dimming system can dump some light out. I looked at a Sony TV last year, uh, the 800 series, their 4k 800 had a fairly reflective screen and it wasn't that bright. Fine right. for a dark room environment. It was phenomenal. But I was in a room that was walled to, or uh, floor to ceiling windows and it was way less impressive in that room environment compared to, you know, it, it was a lot more expensive than the equivalent Vizio. And I think the Vizio in that room with the brighter lights uh, and, and just natural lighting would have performed better. So... It's all about it's all about optimizing it for how you how you view, and uh, 
I will say though, I am I am work. I've been working on a lot of projection systems lately too, which is yeah, I always go back to that as my favorite display technology. Maybe OLED projection and then good LCD. Rip rip plasma. I miss it, but it's okay. It wasn't going to do 4K, and the power consumption's outrageous. <laughs> They're good space heaters. I will admit that. So, two quick things before we go. We got a tweet from. Uh, Joe at Hunt, who says, uh, just listen to this week's Twitch, he asked for questions. For normal Windows use, which is best, more than four gigabytes of RAM or an SSD? Uh, I would say both if you can afford them. I would probably start by upgrading to eight gigabytes of RAM and then getting an SSD. An SSD is going to, you know, it'll launch faster. It'll load large files faster. If everything is stored on the, the SSD, your applications will launch faster. Um, it's a pretty major speed boost in a lot of ways. Uh, the additional RAM will allow Windows to cache additional data in main system memory. Um, you know, you could argue that an SSD is almost as, as fast as main system RAM, but I'm not going to make that argument. Uh, I prefer with OS 10 especially, I want at least 8 gigabytes of RAM, and I think Windows starts to really, really come into its own little happy place with 8 gigabytes of RAM. So I'd probably upgrade the RAM, probably upgrade the SSD because it's most noticeable, then upgrade the RAM. But if you can, do both of them. And uh, something I forgot to mention uh, earlier in the show, Oculus Rift has released their full Rift experience specs. Um, Scott wrote this up for PC Per. Uh, the minimum specs that they talked about last month uh, were like, uh, you know, DVI-D or HDMI output. You should have 1080p, 75 frames per second output. The current list that just came out is a GTX 970 or an AMD Radeon R9 290 or higher, an i5 4590 or higher, 8 gigabytes of RAM or higher, uh, HDMI 1.3, a pair of USB 3.0 ports, and uh, Windows 7 SP1 or newer. So, not DisplayPort uh, 1.3. Not DisplayPort. HDMI 1.3. <laughs> it's a, it's a weird list, right? Because they've got like, <laughs> you know, two of the most high-end GPUs you can buy followed by an HDMI spec that nobody's using anymore because, you know, they're all doing 1.4 or 2.0. Um, so... But I totally agree Just, with you what you said about SSDs, yeah. though. And that, th that is a must nowadays. I've never mm -hmm. had any other I, – I can't think of a more impressive upgrade you can do for any computer than that. Uh, no. that, that, makes even, that makes any computer feel two or three times faster. Uh, it's just – it's the must. And I don't know, but personally, unless you're doing something specific that requires high amounts of RAM – I never see usage above four in most cases, unless unless you're dealing with a lot of data, like either right. like video or photo editing well, or things like that. It, you know, know okay. it's it's cheap enough to where it, just do it, just put it. Yeah, in. I, and that's that is true. You know, you, you there, you, you know, control <laughs> control alt delete task manager and take a look at what's going on with your with your memory usage, and and if you're not, um, you know, right if you're not, now. what's that? Um, I'm actually looking to see what uh, is going on. Memory, I am using. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm actually right now. I am using six and a half gigs. Yeah. Well, I was on, on the machine I'm running right now, which is which is I'm the shocked. three hundred eighty dollars <laughs> gaming machine we built. I had four gigabytes of RAM. I was sitting at three point seven and doing a ton of uh, hits to um, you know the the drive. The best thing to do is go into the resource monitor and take a look at the. Uh, and we were talking about this um, uh, on. Uh, uh, texting a couple weeks ago, uh, take a look at uh, uh, the page faults, what they call it. They used to call them page faults. Now they call them hard faults. If you have a ton of hard faults, that means you're running out of memory and it's going into the disk cache to pull information back. Basically, you know, if you look in your resource monitor on a normal day of usage and you have a ton of hard faults, you need to uh, get more memory in that system. Dude, we got a wrap because they have their okay. next show coming up uh, at the cottage. What's the best place for people to find Mr. Robert Heron and more hey, Mr. Robert Heron? I am Heron. on the Twitter at Robert <laughs> Heron or check out my website, uh, heronfidelity.com. .com. Somebody asked what the best bathroom TV is. Samsung's J4000. It's cheap. That way, if you, if you, it's less than 200 bucks. And if you splash water all over it and it blows up, you're not going to pull your hair out screaming. So, <laughs> unless it fell pulling, in the tub, which I don't recommend. Yeah. Don't put it on the edge of the tub. But. Never mount a Wall television mounted. above a tub. Wall mounted. <laughs>
Wall mounted and put a security strap on that one. Uh, I'm Patrick Norton. You can find me at techthing, T E K T H I N G dot com. Uh, I get to write a little bit for tested.com. And rumor has it, Robert and I actually will launch AVXL this week. We'd like to tease you because that's the way we roll. Well, you've at least, you, your, your living situation has been sorted. You and Michael were both in, in a crazy, like, trying to find a what place a to live space. I'm what finally going to move in with a buddy of mine for a little while just to just just so I can sort some stuff out and just just put some stuff in storage. <laughs> it's going to be like three's company, man. I can seriously. Feel it. Oh. All right. Ryan is uh, has been somewhere in Florida where the Internet does not work uh, at least faster than 9K. It's part of why he wasn't here this week. Robert, we want to thank you so much for making the time for us. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.